My name is Philip Cheek. I was born in Somersetshire, England on May 11, 1841. My parents, Philip and Hannah Cunningham Cheek, came to the United States in 1852 when I was nine years old, first settling in New Jersey, later moving to Providence, Rhode Island, and in 1856, coming to Wisconsin. We settled on a farm in Excelsior Township of Sauk County. I enlisted in the Union Army on May 10th, 1861, in Company A of the 6th Wisconsin Infantry. In December of 1862, I was granted an honorable discharge because of injuries I received in the Great Battle of Antietam on September 17, 1862. I returned to the old Wisconsin farm. In the fall of 1863, I was appointed Assistant Provost Marshal of the district, which is the head of the military police. I served in that position until the close of the war. Appomattox. On Sunday, April 9th, we got up at daylight, but did not move out till after sunrise. We marched along the railroad. During the morning, we could hear cannonading in front of us. The news was passed along that 20,000 rebels had surrendered. It, it, it seemed too good to believe. The firing had ceased at the front. We were halted and went into camp and pitched our tents, something we had not done for a long time. In the afternoon, we saw an officer come riding down the lines, his horse wet and covered with lather. As he passed along, we saw that the boys' caps went up into the air. The welkin rang with cheers. We knew that he bore glad tidings. As he came in front of us, he shouted, General Lee and army have surrendered to General Grant. Cheer, oh no, we yell for joy. We knew the war was ended. They made a splendid and heroic fight for what they firmly believed to be right and lost. The victors that had as firmly believed they were right had said that this nation should remain one, not two. And they bowed to the will of the majority and most of them accepted the result as final. General Lee's army was paroled and sent home. Nothing was done to cause humiliation to the veteran army of Lee. We divided rations with them, and when they left us, the most friendly feeling existed between the men of the two armies. They all got away by the 13th. When the North and the South Carolinians passed our camp on their way home, our boys lined up and cheered them on their way. They bade us goodbye and wished us a speedy and safe return to our homes. We wished them Godspeed and safe return home. It was the end of a splendid organization of officers and men. One of them called back, y'all pick a row with Johnny Bull and we all will help you. And they would. Company A had the honor of furnishing the last commander of the 6th Regiment in its last engagement and at the surrender of General Lee and his army through our captain, L.A. Kent, who commanded the regiment during the last campaign. Company A rang down the curtain on the acts of the regiment that made history, a feat not performed by any other company of any other regiment in the Iron Brigade. Captain Kent in a letter says, as a member of another company in the same regiment for three years, I always had a profound respect for Company A and felt, as we all did, that when Company A stood, the line was safe and the honor of the regiment would be upheld. Sturdivant caught up with the company on the 9th. On the 13th, men cleaned up their arms and accoutrements and the officer made out reports of the campaign. No one felt like work. The strain was over. Relaxation had taken the place of the highly strung nervous tension 
that have possessed us the past two weeks. On April 14th, there was regimental inspection. Company A was found in good condition. On the 15th, we received orders to pack up and be ready to move at noon. On the hour, we moved out in a heavy rain, our regiment in the rear of the brigade. The roads were in bad condition and marching heavy. We marched 15 miles in the direction of Farmville and encamped. On Sunday, April 16th, Reveille at 5 a.m., moved out at 6 a.m., marched on the railroad track to Farmville, a very hard march, where we made our camp. we received official notice of the assassination of our beloved Lincoln. We could hardly believe it. It cast a deep gloom over the army. His taken off in the manner that he was, and just as the silvery lining appeared on the dark war cloud that had enveloped his country, and which gave promise of a lasting peace and joy to his burdened heart, was particularly sad. It was horrible to contemplate the deed. The assassin would have been torn limb from limb could the soldiers have meted out his punishment. On April 17th, we packed up at 3 a.m. and moved out at 6 a.m. and marched on the railroad track past Burkeville on the Danville Railroad, following the railroad some seven miles from the junction where we rested one hour and made coffee. We then struck off to the right across country, marching until sundown where we encamped for the night. On April 18th, we had a chance to obtain a good breakfast as we had orders to form camps by divisions and raise our tents up two feet from the ground. Lieutenant Poynton was detailed to command a foraging party and sent out under the command of a major to procure some corn that was at a place about eight miles from the camp. When they arrived at the place, the lieutenant was ordered to remain with the guard at the house while the major and the teams went to the barn where the corn was stored and loaded it. The lieutenant halted the men in the road in front of the house where they stacked arms and broke ranks. Inside the yard were several beehives upon which the boys looked with longing eyes, visions of mother's nice, light biscuit, spread with honey, rose from their mind's eye. The question was how to get the honey. One fella, more reckless than the rest, solved the problem by putting his arm around the hive, wrenching it from the stand and carrying it through the crowd out to the road. The moment he raised the hive, a black stream of infuriated bees poured out from the bottom of the hive and immediately began a vicious attack on the boys who ran in all directions, their arms working like sails of a windmill. None escaped ceaseless. The lady of the house, who stood in the doorway and saw the performance, enjoyed seeing the boys punished for taking her honey. On the 19th, we broke camp and marched past Burkeville Station and encamped near Nottaway Courthouse. 
it was a hard march. On April 20th, we broke camp and marched to Blacks and White Station. Our brigade was strung along the railroad for the purpose of guarding the same. Our regiment camped about three miles east of the station. On the 21st, we fixed up camp. The boys found some boards and made bunks. About the time we had everything fixed up to take comfort, we were ordered to pack up and move about two miles towards the station and relieve a battalion of the 91st New Yorkers. We bivouacked in a piece of woods. Everybody was mad and cross because we had to move so short a distance and leave our nice camp. Dr. Hall made out <clears throat> prescriptions and a detail with canteens was sent to the uh, <clears throat> commissary and we tried to drown our troubles. Having fun and hilarity, Captain Kent left us to go to Wisconsin to join the 52nd Regiment. April 22nd, pitch tents and arrange camp. We had to patrol the railroad. Regiment held dress parade. April 23rd, Lieutenant Poynton was officer of the day. Lieutenant Holman relieved him and he was ordered to take Company A and act as funeral escort at the funeral of Dr. Johnson, which was a nice compliment to Company A's soldierly appearance and perfection in drill. Regiment held dress parade and inspection. We lay at this camp until May 1st, performing routine camp duty and guarding the railroad, holding dress parade every day. On April 30th, Lieutenant Nelson Moore came back to the company. It was almost a year since he was taken prisoner at the wilderness, confined at Andersonville most of the time since, experiencing all the horrors of that prison pen. He got a royal welcome and warm congratulations on his promotion as second lieutenant of the company. Company A's last recruit, James H. Barber, joined the company while at this camp. When asked why he enlisted in the 6th, he replied that he wanted to see some fighting, if possible, and he thought in the 6th he would find it if it was to be had. On May 1st, we packed up and marched to Wilson Station and encamped. On May 2nd, we marched to within seven miles of Petersburg and encamped. We marched 21 miles that day and did it without being tired out. Colonel Daly conducted the march. May 3rd, we passed through Petersburg in platoon formation. General Warren was present. As we passed him, the men cheered him heartily. We wished to convey to him our sympathy and loyalty. We encamped seven miles from Manchester. On May 4th, we marched to Manchester, a suburb of Richmond, and encamped on a fine location. Visits to Richmond, that city which we had been trying to get into for four long years, was the thing most sought by the boys. They wished to see the place and the many things of interest therein. Libby Prison, Castle Thunder, Bell Isle, State House, Jeff's House, the park around the Capitol containing statues of Washington, equestrian, Monroe and Jefferson, the ruins of the big fire along and between the river, and the street running in front of Libby Prison, and other things of interest. Also, to obtain a bath, shave, and a haircut. The picture galleries had a lucrative business making pictures of the boys who wished to preserve their appearance after going through a strenuous five-week campaign, the last of the war, as souvenirs. The ice cream parlors and soda fountains were well patronized, as were some places that dispensed things stronger than uh, soda water. Some officers hunted the city over to find some crepe to wear as a badge of mourning for President Lincoln, but none could be found. 
It had all been used in making habiliments for mourning to wear in honor of their dead. A lady gave the writer a rosette which she made from black crepe removed from her dress. She did it because it was to be worn for Lincoln and refused to take compensation. To get into the city from camp, we had to cross a bridge spanning the James River at which a guard was stationed to stop the enlisted men not having passes from going into the city. Officers were permitted to go and come without passes. The boys would borrow their officers' coats and go to the city, passing the guard at the bridge without interference. On May 6, we broke camp and began to march to Washington, 120 miles away. The regiment and Company A especially marched splendidly while passing through Richmond, where many of these veterans, accompanied by ladies, viewed the column while passing through. We marched about 17 miles from the city and encamped. The day was very hot. A few sunstrokes occurred. The next day, Sunday, we marched about 10 miles by way of Hanover Courthouse. The 8th, we marched to Milford Station. The day was exceedingly hot and many suffered from heat prostrations. We thought it unnecessary to march men during such hot days after the war was over. At night it rained, cooling the atmosphere. On the 9th, we started out at 6 a.m. and marched to Fredericksburg, crossing the Rappahannock and encamped. It rained in the night. On the 10th, we marched over Potomac Creek Bridge and past Stafford's Courthouse, where we halted for dinner, after which we marched within five miles of Dumfries and encamped. On the 11th, during a march of about 12 miles, we asked the natives how far it was to Alexandria. Each one made it the same number of miles as the one before him had. We began to think we were standing still as the distance grew no less as we approached Alexandria. We reached Fairfax Station and went into camp during a heavy thunder shower. The regiment was marching into a field and was in close column by the companies with muskets right shoulder shift, bayonets fixed, when a heavy bolt of lightning burst over the regiment. The men swayed backwards and to the left from the blinding light. Their faces appeared a ghastly white and the points of the bayonets emitted tongues of flame. It was an awe-inspiring scene. Fortunately, no one was seriously shocked. Company A got a wagon cover and fixed it up for a tent. We all got under it and went to bed. The rain fell in torrents and soon there were streams of water passing between, over and under us, wetting us to the skin. The wind blew the tent down, but we lay quiet beneath it. One of the boys had to go out and in doing so, the cold air got under the tent and wet blankets and chilled us to the marrow. Early in the morning, we got up and stood around the smoky fires and tried to get warm and dry our clothes. It was impossible to do either. We rejoiced when the bugler sounded the general. We started at 7 a.m., marching through the station and Fairfax Courthouse to a point east of Munson's Hill, our old stamping ground of 1861 and 62, where we had camped. On the 13th, we got up feeling refreshed by the good sleep we got during the night. We rested in camp that day, feeling that our days of marching were o'er. On Sunday, May 14th, we moved camp to obtain better grounds. Captain Mele Kent came back and assumed command of the company. He was looking fine and we were glad to see him. On the 15th, we moved to a better location for a camp. On the 16th, we fixed up our tents and had company drill. Up to the 22nd, we performed routine camp duties company, battalion, and brigade drills. On the 22nd, we commenced preparation for the Grand Review. Colonel Daly procured white gloves for the men, 
All our arms and accoutrements were made clean and bright. On May 23rd, 18 and 65, we moved from camp at daylight, marched across Long Bridge to the Capitol, and on to Pennsylvania Avenue, where the review took place. Our brigade occupied its proper position in the line of the 3rd Division of the 5th Corps, our regiment at the head of the brigade. The boys marched splendidly while coming down the avenue in column by companies, and were cheered many times by the people who lined the housetops, windows, and sidewalks by the thousands. Standing near the White House and looking toward the Capitol, the eye caught a magnificent scene. That grand thoroughfare filled its whole length with the veterans of the Army of the Potomac. One could see the bronzed faces of the men, their muskets at right shoulder shift, and interspersed in the line were the commanders of corps, divisions, brigades, and regiments, and their staffs superbly mounted. Above them floated the flags under which they fought, bearing the historic names, Bull Run, Gainesville, South Mountain, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Fitzhugh's Crossing, Chancellorsville, Mine Run, Fair Oaks, Malvern Hill, Seven Pines, Gettysburg, The Wilderness, Laurel Hill, Spotsylvania, North Anna, Cold Harbor, Petersburg, Weldon Railroad, Ream Station, Gravelly Run, Five Forks, Appomattox, besides many others, and the enthusiastic populace cheered them on. It was a sight that will never fade from one's memory. On the 24th, Sherman's army passed in review. They marched in the same order that we did. At the head of each corps marched or straggled a band of foragers called Sherman's Bummers. Things of that character pervaded the entire line. They were a magnificent body of men and made an enviable record. But they lacked that soldierly bearing which characterized the Army of the Potomac. On the 25th, Lieutenant Poynton received leave of absence for 20 days and left us to visit his brother and family in Vermont. He rejoined the company at Jeffersonville, Indiana. The company performed camp duty and drilled until the regiment left Washington on the 17th of June for Louisville, Kentucky, going by rail over the B&O Railway to Parkersburg, Virginia where they embarked on steamers and descended the Ohio River to Louisville, where they arrived on the 22nd of June and went into camp on the Jeffersonville side of the river. Ten Western regiments from the Army of the Potomac were organized as a provisional division under the command of General Morrow of the 24th Michigan. The 6th Wisconsin was assigned to the 2nd Brigade and was commanded by Colonel Dennis B. Daly and Company A by Captain L.A. Kent. There was a strong belief amongst the men that certain officers in our division were trying to have certain of the regiments retained in the service, the 6th Wisconsin being one of them. The men wanted to go home and were vexed because we were not mustered out also at the inability of proper officers to procure blank discharge papers. The government supply had become exhausted and the blanks could not be obtained through the regular channels. A very unpleasant state of affairs existed. Upon Lieutenant Poynton's return to the company, he went at his own expense to Camp Chase at Columbus and procured enough blank discharge papers to supply our needs as soon as they could be made out we were discharged which was on the 14th day of July 18 and 65 and we started for home 
arriving at Madison on July 16th, where we became the recipients of an enthusiastic public welcome in the Capitol Park at the hands of the state officers and citizens. At the conclusion of the ceremonies, the words of command were given. The bronze veterans wheeled to the right. Drums and fife struck up their stormy music, and with guns at right shoulder shift and bayonets gleaming in the slant sunbeams, under the green arches of the summer trees, the last fragment of the old Iron Brigade of the Army of Potomac, bearing the rent and shot torn banners on which were inscribed the names of such historic battles as Gainesville, Bull Run, South Mountain, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Fitzhugh's Crossing, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, The Wilderness, Laurel Hill, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, Petersburg, Weldon Railroad, Hatcher's Run, Gravelly Run, Five Forks, and Appomattox passed on to dissolve and disappear from men's eyes forever, but to live immortal in history and in the memory of a grateful people. The boys visited Elon Wyman in the hospital. He was very low and fast passing away. The end came for him on July 23rd. It was heartbreaking to see his intense suffering, knowing that there was no hope of saving his life. His desire to live and enjoy the comradeship of those just returned from the fields of battle, camps, and weary marches of four long years of service in which he had participated until wounded unto death was intense. We bade him farewell as parting from a loved brother, realizing full well that when we next met, it would be in that final bivouac on the other shore. Home again. After finishing the business pertaining to our service, we left Madison for Baraboo, where in due time we arrived. On the third day of August, we met with a warm and enthusiastic reception from our kindred, loyal friends and the ladies of Baraboo, who during the entire war were untiring in ministering to the wants of the soldier in the hospital, at the front, or wherever stationed, working days and nights, yes, and on Sundays, preparing supplies for our sick and wounded. May God bless them for their noble work. The memory of their noble deeds is enshrined in the hearts of the survivors of that war. Their patriotism and labors helped to gain the great victory achieved by our army. The reception given us was a most royal one. General A. W. Starks presided at the meeting on the square. Reverend Mr. Clark made a very impressive prayer. Reverend Mr. Irish delivered the address of welcome. General Fairchild of the Old Second, Kellogg and Malloy of the Sixth, Colonels Calkins of the Third Cavalry and Daly of the Sixth, Major Williams and Hall, Captain Vanderpool, and the Honorable James Ross were present as guests and made eloquent addresses. General Fairchild, with his armless sleeve, received an ovation. He was always a favorite with the boys. After speaking, we marched to Taylor's Hall and partook of an elegant repast. In the evening, Major Noyes gave us a reception which was largely attended. The men that composed Company A came from ranks of the people and left their several avocations to join that volunteer army of patriots that banded themselves together to preserve this nation, even at the risk of their lives. Many gave the full measure of devotion and lie on southern fields. Others came back crippled for life or disabled by wound or disease. A few of the noble fellows were spared to take part in the final ending and to see the restoration of peace. 
they laid aside the implements of war and returned to peaceful avocations as private citizens took their place amongst the workers and are helping to make this nation the greatest on earth.